How would you like to see into the future? Try looking up. A planet facing dangerous new threats is turning to new technology and unleashing a bold new era in air power. The stakes are sky high. So are the battle lines. How is the Air Force of tomorrow going to rise to the challenge? With unparalleled speed, stealth, and precision engagement, we are seeing the dawn of a new era of air power, unmatched in human history. Air, space, global vigilance, reach, and power. The blending of the new technology of war. They strike without warning. With precision and power, they can elude, locate, and level the enemy. They're fast, very fast. They are the flagships of a new age of aerial combat. But today's Air Force is flying uncharted skies. The nature of warfare has radically changed. This enemy knows no borders and defies detection. To the United States and its allies, the challenge has fallen. Wars in the 21st century must be fought quickly, won with minimal risk, and driven by technology. The military is being reshaped from the ground up, way up. How will Allied Air Command pull it off? The eyes of the world are on the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory, located at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base near Canton, Ohio where the future of aerial combat is taking shape. When we look out to the future, you know, we've got to be 10, 15, 20 years out. So one of the things we try to look at is what is our North Star? What are we guiding toward? In the lab, we've moved toward looking at a technical vision, which goes something like the following. It will be to anticipate, find, fix, target, track, engage, assess, anyone, anywhere, anytime. That's a pretty uh, you know, audacious goal to be able to think of in the future. We're going toward, but that is to enable us to have the ability to better prosecute environments like we are now in the global war on terror. So rather than wait and have to react to an incident to see if we can't use all our information resources, pull them together, and intelligence assets to be able to determine what it's going to happen, react to it before, and then have the ability to quickly engage whatever that adversary is and whatever the conditions are, no matter how far away we were when it started. The quest for the ultimate aircraft. It must be stealthy, it must be precise, but there's one objective above all. It's got to fly fast. Since the first plane was piloted, the goal has always been speed. In uh, 1903, advances in the piston engine allowed the Wright brothers to successfully fly their airplane. In the 1930s and 40s, the work of uh, Dr. James Whittle and Dr. Hans von Oheim developed the turbine engine, which eventually revolutionized aerodynamics and the way in which we operate today. The 1940s, in the heat of the Second World War, the P-51 Mustang is flying 400 miles per hour and leading the Allies to victory. By decade's end, a young P-51 Ace flies faster than any human ever had. Chuck Yeager in the X-1 test plane cracks Mach 1 and flies 761 miles per hour, or 1,225 kilometers per hour, faster than the speed of sound. The most useful thing I ever did was, was the X-1, breaking the sound barrier, because up until that time, we, had, we were hamstrung. And, and unless we could get above Mach 1 and find out how to fly through Mach 1, we would never go anywhere, including space. And after nine flights and 93 days, we got the airplane above Mach 1. It's a boom heard round the world. The age of the supersonic aircraft has begun. In 1962, 
North American Aviation's rocket-powered X-15 shatters all records when it flies Mach 6.7, almost seven times the speed of sound. Today's jet fighters routinely fly faster than the speed of sound. The F-15 and F-16 can reach speeds of almost Mach 3. But they're about to be left in the dust thanks to a whole new approach to pushing the speed limit. What moves any aircraft through the air is thrust. All thrust is generated through some application of Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The jet's engine sucks in air, pressurizes it, and mixes it with fuel to make it ignite. That combination blasts out the back and propels the aircraft forward. Turbojet engines have carried the speed load. In a turbojet engine, the high pressure in the combustor is generated by a compressor, which compresses the air before the fuel is injected, and then forces it out to create higher levels of thrust. To add up to 50% more thrust, fighter jets are souped up with afterburners to torch any remaining oxygen by injecting fuel into the exhaust system. But ultimately, the speed of air-breathing jet engines reaches its limit. Now an innovative new engine design may one day break all the speed records. We've continued to also press out the envelope in terms of increasing speed by developing a thing called a ramjet. Basically, it's a device that uses the forebody to compress the air and can operate from about Mach 2 up to Mach 5. One of the most legendary planes ever flown was the Lockheed SR-71, unofficially known as the Blackbird. Able to travel at speeds over Mach 3, the SR-71 still holds the speed record for manned air-breathing vehicles, able to fly from Los Angeles to New York in 64 minutes. The aircraft flew so fast and so high that if the pilot detected a surface-to-air missile launch, the standard evasive action was simply to accelerate. No SR-71 was ever shot down. The SR-71 also had another important distinction, being one of the first air vehicles to use ramjet technology. The SR-71 is actually a combination cycle engine. It's a high-speed turbine, but it also then takes at the higher speeds and brings air around the turbine core and burns it as a ramjet. We're going beyond that today. We're developing a supersonic combustion ramjet, or scramjet, that can operate from Mach 4 to Mach 7 on conventional jet fuels. That could also be extended to higher speeds up to about Mach 14 if we were to switch to hydrogen as a fuel. The beauty of the ramjet is its simplicity. Its internal shape channels airflow and slows it for subsonic combustion. The engine doesn't need a compressor so it's lighter. The result? The ability to reach even higher speeds. But that's just the start. Air is pushed against the body panel and acts as a compression surface. The air is then captured and compressed into the inlet of the engine, where it mixes with fuel and is burned. It then expands out and goes into a nozzle and shoots out the back of the engine, creating thrust. March 2004, NASA sets out to make aviation history with the first successful flight of an unmanned scramjet-powered aircraft. The goal, to achieve Mach 5, breaking through to the fabled speed range, hypersonic. High above the California coast, the scramjet blows the doors off its designer's every expectation. It hit Mach 7, 5,000 miles per hour, or greater than 8,000 kilometers per hour. Just one year later, a test flight scores an unprecedented Mach 10. Scramjet is a major breakthrough, and not just in raw jet power.
The most feasible hypersonic engines are relatively small. Uh, consequently, the most attractive application would be a hypersonic cruise missile. We've got subsonic cruise missiles today. Uh, some countries are working on supersonic cruise missiles, hypersonic cruise missiles, uh, very fast, very long range, I think may be an attractive application for this technology a decade down the road. One day, scramjets may revolutionize the way future spacecraft are lofted into orbit. The space shuttle has to carry all of its oxidizers because it's purely rocket power. So it has this huge oxygen tank that you see the, the actual shuttle strapped to and the two solid motors then attached to it. That oxygen tank is providing oxygen for the shuttle's main engines during ascent while those boosters are still attached and a little bit beyond that. Imagine if we could use, instead of carrying that big tank of oxygen, if we could grab oxygen from the air and not have to have that large a tank. That would then let us go from about four and a half million pounds sitting on the pad ready to go for a space shuttle down to less than 1.4 million pounds for a more conventional looking vehicle that would take off from a normal runway, accelerate up, and then separate a second stage rocket, and that would then go up. In the not so distant future, scramjets may transport tourists into space or carry airline passengers across the world in a single hour. We're advancing that technology and we're learning how to make bigger, better, more efficient engines, the same as Whittle and Von Oheim did with the turbines. And the time will come when those engines are just as efficient and will allow operation in that regime, Mach 5 to Mach 7, on a routine basis. For bad guys, scramjets will mean trouble. Someday, enemy targets will be mere minutes away. While speed will help future jet fighters take the enemy by surprise, sometimes that might not be enough. To really arrive unannounced takes more. The Air Force of the future has to be invisible. Nineteen seventy four. The U.S. military begins work on a top secret project code named Harvey, after the invisible rabbit of movie fame. At Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works facility, engineers try to do the impossible create an airplane that can't be seen a plane that will fly virtually undetectable to radar, using a new technology that will become known as stealth. Stealth is, is the art of making something low observable. People tend to think of it as a radar issue, but it's really much more than that. It's, it's low noise, it's low to the visual spectrum, it's low to the infrared spectrum. A lot of people think something just developed, stealth happened. It didn't just happen. To the public it appeared that way, but there was a long, steady investment, because before it becomes common practice, it takes five, ten, or more years sometimes to get the fundamental science understood and brought into practice. The SR-71 was the first operational aircraft designed around a stealthy shape and materials. But it was still easily detected because of its exhaust stream. More work was needed. Fifteen very secretive years later, in 1989, the Air Force's black jet is unveiled to the public. It could pass for a set piece from a science fiction film, but every aspect of the F-117 is designed to make it invisible to radar. How? First understand the way radar works. Electromagnetic waves are transmitted in pulses. They bounce off objects and return. The discrepancy between the time it takes for these echoes to return tell radar operators the altitude, speed, and bearing of an aircraft. But scientists have discovered that by creating a skin made up of small angled panels, they could make a plane virtually invisible. The cockpit is also sharply angled and coated with reflective material. Bombs and other radar reflecting features are stored deep within. And in a master stroke, the engine's exhaust nozzles are located on top of the wings and body, making sightings from infrared-guided anti-aircraft missiles below virtually impossible. Once the new technology has proven itself, the Air Force one-ups it by commissioning two stealth bombers, the notorious B-1 and B-2. At first, the controversial projects would face cost overruns and criticism, but eventually, 
both planes would get to prove themselves in combat. But the Batwing-shaped B-2 Spirit is the most expensive plane ever built. At a cost of $2 billion each, they have no high-speed afterburners, no missiles to return fire, nothing to protect them but sheer stealth. And sometimes, stealth is not enough. Imagine if the B-2 was to fall prey to events that, in 1999, downed an American F-117. Using an old Russian-made missile, Yugoslav gunners shoot it down during fighting in Kosovo. The attack calls U.S. air superiority into question. Can a warplane be designed to do it all? To dodge radar and launch an attack as well? That plane would dominate the skies in the 21st century. The challenge that we face in working more now is how do you integrate sets of technologies together so that you have a game-changing kind of capability at the system level. We used to focus more on, oh, if I had a faster repulsion, I could enable this. So if I had new understanding of self, I could enable that. A lot of those technologies are getting more mature. It's how do you combine all those things together? How do you look at getting the right information to the person, what the right effect is you want on a weapon? What is the kind of response and persistence that you want in that capability? It's combining several different cross-disciplines, multidisciplinary technologies together is where the lab's really pushing the state of the art in the next five to 10 years. It's gonna be how do we combine things in ways we never thought of combining them before and linking those advancements to really make the steps. Right now, a lot of our survival platforms like the B-2 are uh, subsonic. We wanna try to see if we can't go to doing supersonic kind of platforms, which means flying faster than the speed of sound, maybe two, three times that. So I'll go more to some of the speeds that our fighters have in our bombers, combine that stealth and speed together into the future in a way we haven't done yet. One giant step in maintaining air power has already taken shape today. Designated as a future replacement for the F-15, the F-22 Raptor is the first military jet to harness both speed and stealth. Loaded with secret technology, making it extremely difficult to track, the Raptor is expected to be the first warplane capable of simultaneously conducting air-to-air -air and air-to-ground combat missions with near impunity. There's a little catchphrase called, you won't see us coming, but you'll know we've been there. That means that we are, in fact, low observable, but we're also lethal at the same time. So, so should the U.S. ever have to employ this weapon system in combat, uh, it will maintain that, that technological advantage and that superiority that we need to keep dominance in the skies in the future. It is a multi-mission fighter designed to fly surveillance and reconnaissance sorties, as well as missions of precision attack. It has the ability to super cruise maintaining speeds beyond Mach 1.5 for extended periods without the use of fuel-guzzling afterburners. Thrust vectoring was added using nozzles in the back of the engine to direct thrust up or down. This allows the F-22 to fly at a 60-degree angle, an angle that would stall most aircraft. Its avionics control panels show the fighter pilot the whole picture on a series of displays. An enemy aircraft is a red triangle. An unidentified aircraft is a yellow square. A green square is a friendly aircraft. Wingmen are in blue. The entire battlefield is brought into focus, easily and effortlessly. Its weapon systems are hidden for maximum stealth capabilities along with its engines. When and if this high-tech but highly expensive jet becomes fully deployed, its advanced technology would ensure U.S. and Allied air superiority for decades to come. But the F-22 isn't the only stealth fighter promising to rule the skies. Designed as a joint strike fighter, the F-35 will be flown by the U.S. Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps, along with the Royal Navy and Air Force of the United Kingdom. All F-35s will feature the same stealth design, yet each service has modified the plane to serve its own needs.
The distinguishing feature of the Marine's version is its short takeoff and vertical landing capability, known as Stover. The Pratt & Whitney 119 engine turns a counter-rotating lift fan and produces a cool air lift force, allowing the JSF-35 to hover. It can then transition into standard fighter mode and travel at supersonic speeds. It can also do the reverse, which will allow it to get to the battle quickly and land in places that don't have a runway, providing invaluable close air support. Unlike the Navy's Harrier and F-A-18 and the Air Force's F-16 it is replacing, the JSF, like the F-22, has an advanced stealthy design. The Navy's requirements are just as demanding. Its F-35 has larger wing and tail control surfaces to make low-speed approaches onto aircraft carriers easier. And that increased wingspan will also stock it with a monster payload. Along with the F-22 Raptor, it will transform the Air Force into an almost all-stealth fighter force by 2025. Speed, stealth, two down and one to go. To make the grade in the 21st century, warplanes must also be precise. March 2003, America and its allies invade Iraq. It is a broader, more extensive operation than the first Gulf War, but with half the number of forces. Never before in the history of warfare have air power and precision weaponry played such a decisive role. Allied warplanes would use the same kind of smart weapons that premiered in 1991, but this time, it's a whole new game. New space and aerial surveillance technology make this the first remote-controlled war. Officers as far away as the Pentagon, just outside of Washington, D.C., receive real-time data on enemy positions and give orders to commanders in the field. Day after day, bombs and missiles obliterate key Iraqi military installations, one after another. Some are guided by lasers, both on the ground and in the air. Some by infrared systems. Others use television cameras on the munitions that pilots guide into their targets using joysticks. Still others use the Global Positioning System, or GPS technology, and can send the weapons to a highly specific location. In the past, bombing missions might have been scrubbed because of smoke, dust, or bad weather. Now, using GPS, the assault is unstoppable. The Air Force has also upgraded older, non-precision bombs by hot-wiring inexpensive GPS navigation systems to their tail fins. Some of these new smart bombs could now be dropped from a plane and then guided to their destinations. In the war's opening week, precision bombs take out Iraqi anti-aircraft batteries and tanks time and again. In the first Gulf War of 1991, just 8% of the air munitions were precision guided. The second time around, 12 years later, 70%. But the campaign is far from perfect. Friendly fire and accidental bombings take a toll. Those mistakes bear lessons. Coupled with an uncanny overall bombing accuracy, they've since spurred development of smaller, even more precise munitions. As most folks know, we are able today to have uh, some very precise GPS-guided weapons. Uh, the smallest size of that weapon right now is about 500 pounds. That still creates a fairly large fragmentation and bomb pattern. We're working on one called Small Diameter Bomb, which will be a 250 pounder. So by increasing precision, you're able to decrease the amount of uh, kinetic energy you want from the explosive to have the same effect. What that allows you to do is carry twice as many weapons, so carry, attack twice as many targets, and reduce the amount of collateral damage so we can be even more precise.
The technology trend may be towards smaller, more accurate weapons, but can smart bombs be made even smarter? Most people are familiar with laser-guided and GPS-guided munitions. In a laser-guided one, you're basically following a beam down to a target that some second person has to laze and hold there. The future of that technology is want to take lasers and now use them to be able to kind of take that laser beam and scan over time and literally come back with an image of what you're seeing. So basically create a laser image that you can look at and actually process in the weapon. So you could tell that weapon, here's a picture of a tank, I'm going to release you, go over to the battlefield, when you find that, engage it. So you have this kind of uh, formable or adaptable weapon that will go out and will search for its target, identify its target, can confirm it back if it needs to to the man, and say, okay, this is it, how do I take it out? These intelligent weapons will someday be able to adjust their strength to better suit the target. And be able also to shape the weapon that's inside of there because the way you might want to hit a tank or hit a jeep are different. A weapon smart enough to practice restraint is a weapon fine-tuned for ambush. Think also of a class of weapons that they call Dominator, which you'd be able to go out and put several of these out. They would fly like racetrack patterns over an area, and they would never attack anything unless they needed to. So they kind of were a deterrent. You could put them in a pass on a mountainside and say, okay, I don't want the enemy to come through that particular pass. I don't want to have a manned platform sitting there surveilling that all the time. I'll launch this small group of weapons. They'll stay out for some period of time. If they find someone, they are capable of engaging it. If not, they're cheap enough to just fall down. There's no technology that's gained from their loss, and you've accomplished your mission, which was to hold that particular position. A new class of weapons is being designed to stop the enemy in its tracks. The sensor-fused weapon is designed to strike enemy armor and support vehicles. Once released, it hovers over the battlefield. At a precise time, it opens and dispenses 10 submunitions that are attached to parachutes. Each submunition has four armor-piercing projectiles with infrared sensors to detect armored targets, like tanks and trucks. At a preset altitude, a rocket motor fires. It spins the submunition, and they start to head downward. The submunitions fire projectiles, which search for heat sources, like the exhaust from a tank. Forty projectiles strike at once, destroying an entire armored battalion with one shot. It's called the AGM-130, and it utilizes advanced technologies to strike at hardened targets. Using an inertial navigation system coupled with GPS, the AGM-130 is extremely accurate. Once it is two or three miles from the target, the pilot can lock on to strike at a specific point, like a window, and then it's steered in using a television camera on its nose. Perhaps the smartest weapon in the Air Force arsenal is the JASSM. It is a long-range missile that can be fired over 200 miles away from a target. A mission plan is programmed into JASSM, similar to cruise missiles. Once fired, the device's navigation system takes over. It's known as fire and forget. Once in flight, the JASSM is stealthy and has anti-jamming technology. It can hit a specific spot on a target, like a cave or a ventilation shaft, with precision accuracy. Precision smart weapons are just part of the new technology story. Imagine an aircraft, minus its pilot. All the Earth is under watch. But satellites don't tell the whole story. The military needs a better view of its enemies. Flying over hostile terrain has its risks. America learned that lesson first from the Cold War, starting that dark day in 1961, when a U-2, the first high-altitude spy plane, was shot down and its pilot captured by the Russians. Ever since, the U.S. Air Force has made a priority of changing the way it does reconnaissance. They're not much to look at, peculiar aircraft that are slow and defenseless. But the Pentagon is betting that UAVs will become the linchpin of the Allied arsenal. 
unmanned aerial vehicles have already proven their metal. In Iraq, in Afghanistan, in classified hotspots across the globe, high-flying UAVs are providing spy agencies and war departments with instant snapshots of their foes. UAVs ID targets for aviators and ground forces and can beam live pictures of battle to Allied command thousands of miles away for review. Like a lot of good ideas, UAVs aren't new. There are folks that will claim that a UAV actually flew in 1901 before the Wright brothers, and the first powered flight was unmanned. It's not new. What has really evolved and enabled things to change dramatically was the revolution in information technology. So the kind of sensors and the kind of intelligence that we can put on board these machines has really enabled the current revolution that we see today that you know comes from predators, now global hawks, and then looking into JUCAS and other things into the future. UAVs have evolved from low-tech drones to high-tech tools of war. It's called Hunter and it's been airborne since 1999. Its payload is strictly reconnaissance. With television cameras and infrared radar, it provides surveillance day and night for NATO and UN missions. The U.S. Air Force has its own pocket-sized version, a mini UAV for soldiers in the field. Launched with a bungee cord, Desert Hawk flies at 40 to 80 miles per hour. Its cameras bring enemy positions and troop strength into sharp focus, and it can transmit real-time pictures straight to a laptop computer. Then there's the mega-sized Global Hawk. With a wingspan of 116 feet, or 35 meters, and a dazzling array of high-res imaging devices, this high-flying UAV is designed to sweep wide geographic areas with pinpoint accuracy. But UAVs aren't just scouts. November 2002, a vehicle speeds across the Yemeni desert. Among its passengers, a notorious Al-Qaeda leader. Operatives want him taken out, quietly. But how? A Hellfire missile destroys the car, courtesy of a remotely piloted Predator drone, a direct hit. The era of the Unmanned Combat Aerial Vehicle, or UCAV, able to strike quickly and precisely anywhere in the world, had begun. The next generation, unmanned fighter jets that can maneuver at G-forces that would overwhelm human pilots. Battle plans and bombs will be preloaded, and the new robot planes will carry out their missions. What will they look like? Meet the prototype. The X-45 is an otherworldly aircraft. With a jagged 49-foot bat wing, this stealth drone can cruise at nearly Mach 1. Unlike traditional UCAVs, whose flight video and weapons are operated at a distant base with a joystick. The X-45 is programmed to actually fly itself. The future is to look out toward a different vision where you have teams of UAVs that cooperate and work with each other, share information, share intelligence, share decisions on what target to attack with a human supervisor but not someone who's directly touching the loop. You can think of it the same way as we send out today a manned foreship. We do an awful lot of training, there's a lead in that foreship, and they've got a set of rules of engagement and they know what the mission's gonna be. Once they cross the line of battle, the mission usually changes. They use their training to react and adjust and complete the mission within the best set of conditions that they can. And we wanna put that same capability into a foreship of UAVs. One of the things that we're actively investigating and in this room is set up to do that is how do you blend manned and unmanned systems in combat? So what we have behind us is we have some uh, medium fidelity simulations of a cockpit. Over on the other side, we have a, a simulation of what is the mission control station. And what this allows us to do is to figure out different parts of the mission, how we communicate back and forth, how we develop tactics, so we really best utilize the capabilities. And also to figure out what really who does what really best? What you're trying to do is enhance the power of that battle manager. You don't think of a UAV operator as being strictly a pilot, although they need air skills. What they want to be is a battle manager because they could be controlling four, eight, 
or more systems at once, all linked by machine to act on their will of what they want to be able to prosecute that battle for. So these environments are designed where we can bring in real pilots, real UAV operators, put our best technology in front of them and kind of sim, learn, sim, learn, sim, learn, and then take it out on the ranges and fly it. So we can kind of peel back that onion and understand what's the real art of the possible, what makes sense and what doesn't. A normal force package that goes out will have F-35s in the future, the F-22s, it'll have uh, JUCASs, and they'll each be doing a part of that in a coordinated ballet and dance the way we do today. And it shouldn't matter that somebody is in there, whether that's a manned or unmanned system off their wing. Now, the unmanned systems will have certain capabilities that they'll do better, potentially just like an F-22 has certain capabilities that make it better than an F-15 or an F-16 or something like that, but you'll be able to blend those and you'll be able to change. So you won't just come in with a rote mission plan or you'll be able to plan as you engage the enemy and say, okay, here's how we're going to regroup. UABs, you're now going to go do this. 22, you're now going to go do this. And be able to manage that back and be able to figure out what's the best way to blend those systems together. That's the future battle space. It's stealthy, precise, fast, and unmanned. UAV aircraft of the future have it all. But there's room for one more improvement, a new class of weapons that never needs to be replenished. Traditional weapons can be used once. When you're out of bombs, it's back to base you go to reload. But what if your aircraft could have weapons unlimited? What if you could steal a page from James Bond with lasers? The advantage that you have in a laser environment is that uh, you're extremely precise. So can I go and engage that particular target with a laser? For example, be very precise, be able to hit a particular part on a vehicle, say, and disable it without blowing it up. Also, if you've developed an electric laser, then you don't run out of munition, in effect. You run out of munition when you run out of gas. So you basically use your turbine engine to be able to create electricity, which powers the laser, so you, in theory, can have a more, almost an infinite magazine. The other inherent aspect that a laser could give you is kind of dial a yield. So you can adjust the power of that laser from everything to having a non-lethal effect to having a lethal effect. So what it buys you is flexibility and persistence, and those are things we're always trying to get in the battlefield and give the commander more options on how they deal with that particular threat or target. Another 20 years from now, we could be looking at that kind of capability to have uh, offensive and defensive lasers on fighter class aircraft. And those lasers won't be chemical, they'll be more electrical or liquid kind of lasers. Lasers on fighter jets are still years away, but a high energy chemical iodine laser has been mounted on a modified Boeing 747 and is ready for use today. The airborne laser will locate and track missiles in the boost phase of their flight. From there, it's just point and shoot. A new technology is being used to help create the materials that will protect pilots and build better sensor suites. But you can't see this technology with the naked eye. It's the science of nanotechnology, the ability to work with particles at the molecular level and create new materials one atom at a time. I think a, a lot of people hear the term nanotechnology and think of it as a technology that will deliver a device or a, a, a unit that you can look at and point to and say that's nano. Uh, hearkening to even maybe uh, Crichton's, Michael Crichton's book about the great goo and the, and the nano machines, self-replicating nano machines. That is not nanotechnology. That is what I would consider more uh, science fiction or at the very least 50, 100 years out. What what nano more is, is the ability to do things better. Our ability now to manipulate, control matter, place things where we want, allow us to uh, create new devices, create new materials with properties and suites of properties that we've never been able to before. Nanotechnology allows scientists at the Air Force Research Lab to design new materials from the ground up, atom by atom, layer by layer, in this case, represented by a geometric prism. One example of a material we're designing for an infrared sensor is a, a super lattice material where we actually take different layers of atoms and build a structure from scratch, something you couldn't actually find in nature. 
In this case, we're doing a structure that starts off with indium arsenide. So we have indium atoms and arsenic atoms. And we grow several atomic layers of that structure. Then we switch to using gallium atoms and antimony atoms. And we'll grow just a few atomic layers of that. And then we'll switch back to doing indium and arsenic again. And when we build this up, this gives us a new crystal lattice that you wouldn't find, uh, like say, in a normal compound. By how thick we grow each layer, and which compositions we use in each layer, so we can design in specific properties to that material. And that in this case, we're usually designing in specific kinds of wavelength ranges uh, for different applications, because there's a lot of different wavelengths that you use uh, in the military sensing. Nanotechnology will one day allow scientists to make astounding improvements to aircraft. For instance, to modify lightweight materials like plastic or ceramic and give them conducting properties. Lighter weight wires means lighter weight aircraft. Nanotechnology will give optic materials like glass exceptional properties. For example, creating a multi-purpose lens to operate at many different wavelengths. And one day, also using nanotechnology, scientists may create self-healing materials, which may even allow an aircraft to repair its own skin. The new technology of war and its promise of sweeping transformation faces one formidable challenge, however, the human factor. How do you get technologies and weapon systems to work together? It calls for a whole new approach to maintaining order and command, one that another branch of the military already coined. Network-centric warfare is a term that originated uh, with the U.S. Navy back in the uh, mid-1990s. It represented for the Navy a fundamentally different way of thinking about warfare at sea. Historically, uh, it was enormously difficult for ships at sea to communicate with uh, headquarters back on the shore, difficult for them even to communicate with each other. Uh, you could talk on the radio, but that would give your position away, so you tried not to talk on the radio. And as a result, the captain was master of his ship, but basically each ship was uh, normally pretty much going to be on their own. And then, with the development of high-speed communications in the early 90s, the Navy began to realize that they could use satellite communications to get large amounts of data to their ships, and that they could use wideband communications to get an enormous amount of data uh, from headquarters to ships and from ship to ship and from airplane to ship and from satellite, reconnaissance satellite to ship. And suddenly they realized that rather than having a bunch of ships driving around out there, that they had a fleet and that the fleet was a network of ships all operating as a single system of systems. Network-centric warfare has since caught fire with the rest of the military. For the Air Force, its technological centerpiece is poised more than 22,000 miles up in space. MILSTAR is a constellation of satellites that connects air, sea, and land operations with secure, jam-proof communications. Each satellite serves as a smart switchboard in space by relaying traffic from terminal to terminal anywhere on Earth. But like all its emerging technologies, the Air Force wants to revolutionize the design of satellites to come. One of the key themes is moving toward what we call operationally responsive space. In today's environment, it takes months to be able to get a satellite, put it up in orbit, and get it to work. Even once we get it up there, it takes a fair amount of time. We don't always know where we want to put that satellite. We don't know where that particular threat is going to be. What we want to move toward is kind of following the information revolution and the IT revolution allows us to shrink and make things smaller. Now instead of these large satellites, make the satellite smaller, put it onto a smaller rocket, launch it quicker, have some of the same capabilities. So be more responsive, move toward operating in space the way we kind of operate in air. As the Earth's orbit becomes a new sphere for military operations, space itself will become a battleground. Imagine energy weapons, anti-satellite missiles, and scramjets doing Mach 10 across the upper atmosphere. Space-based weapons like these may someday become as common as the aerial arsenal of today. The Allied Air Forces are striving to reinvent themselves. They're staking their claim to superiority on new technology, 
on transforming their vast air fleets into ever quicker, ever stealthier, more precise, and powerful tools of war. With every innovation, the battle lines are redrawn, and the stakes are raised higher and higher. With all the unknowns the future holds, there is one sure thing. Victory belongs to whoever rules the skies. <laughs>